If you die tomorrow, do you think you would go to heaven? Well, if you answered, I think so, or I hope so, well, every day you're not sure, you're gambling with your soul. Do you know that the majority of the world will never enter the kingdom of heaven? Because of ignorance, many are led into false religions, and others are so consumed with the cares of this world that they are simply oblivious to God's final judgment. Don't ignore the most important decision of your life. But before we go to eternity in heaven, God deals with the wicked. It's the last judgment known in the Bible, discussed in the Bible. It's called the great white throne judgment. But there's certainly a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And right at the close of history, right before the dawn of eternity, God raises up the wicked. And he raises them up for the great white throne judgment. It's for all those people since the beginning of man, for all those people that rejected God, that rejected the love of God. As Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved, but they took pleasure in wickedness. All those folks are going to be resurrected one day to stand before the Lord at the great white throne of judgment. This is not a happy day. This is not a day that God looks forward to. This is a sad day. As a matter of fact, it's the saddest day in history. Don't ever get the idea that when you die, that's all there is. You die, you're dead and gone. Like some hippie atheist had put on his tombstone. Please don't dig me, I'm really gone. But it's not like that at all. Because God's going to raise you up. Just as he raised Jesus up, he's going to raise the wicked up to stand before him. I saw, John says, the dead, the great, and the small. Now, I think that we can put the great and the small all together in four categories. Four categories of people, I believe, will be at the great white throne judgment. First of all, the willfully wicked will be there. The willfully wicked. These are the people that don't care anything about God, that don't give a rip about the Bible or about God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They could care less. And they, they, they are the disbelievers, the mockers, the scoffers, those that like to make fun. The Madeline Murray O'Hares, who spent, that lady who spent her, nearly her whole life trying to tell people God doesn't exist. The Adolf Hitlers, who tried to exterminate God's chosen people, the Jews, Hitler will be there. Madeline Murray O'Hare will be there. And the people that we see today on television, those who love to mock and scoff and make fun of holy things, those who love to take the name of the Lord and run it through the sewer, people like that will be there. Maybe you're familiar with that comedian, Kathy Griffin. Kathy Griffin won an award in 2007 and she got up to receive her Emmy Award, and she said, you know, oftentimes people come to a podium and they thank Jesus for helping them win this award. She said, let me tell you, no one had less to do with me winning this award than did Jesus. And then she held up her trophy, and she said, in your face, Jesus, this is now my God. The willfully wicked will be there at the throne. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. But now the second category of person that will be there, the self-righteous soul, will be there. Now this person is totally opposite from the willfully wicked. This is the person who is so good. And that they think that the good news about Jesus, the cross of Christ and the empty tomb, well, you know, that story is a great story but it's for the drunk. It's for the pimp and the prostitute and the mugger and the murderer. It's for the bad people. It's not for me. 
They say, why, why do I need that? I'm so good. Adrian Rogers used to say, many people in America are strutting their way to hell. They're egomaniacs strutting their way to hell, thinking they're too good to be damned. Jesus told a story in Luke 18 about the Pharisee and the tax gatherer. And Jesus said that they both went up to the temple to pray. And in Luke 18, verse 11, he said this, The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer, this tax collector. Lord, I'm not like that at all. I fast twice a week. I paid tithes on all that I have. Lord, you are so lucky to have me. And Jesus said that the tax gatherer stood at a distance and he wouldn't even look up to heaven. He had his head down and he was just beating his chest. And he said, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Have mercy on me, the sinner. And Jesus said, listen, I tell you the truth. That tax gatherer went home justified and that Pharisee just went home. He didn't ever see his need. He said, I don't need you, Lord, because I am righteous on my own. I talked to a lady one time in college, and I was asking her about a relationship with the Lord. I said, hey, if you were to die and stand before God, what would you say to God if he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And she said this to me. She said, well, I would tell him because I deserve it. Because I deserve it. I was shocked. I thought, man, this lady's a million miles from the kingdom. She thinks she deserves it. No one deserves it. The self-righteous person will be there. But not only the willfully wicked, the self-righteous soul, the procrastinating person will be there. This is the third category. This is the person who heard the gospel, heard about the cross, and heard about the empty tomb, and heard about the offer that Jesus makes to every person to save that person if they'll just call upon him. This person hears all that. This person receives all that. This person believes, yes, that's right. That's what a person needs to do. That's what I need to do. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make that decision tomorrow. I'm just going to make it a little later. i got a lot of things going on in my life right now, so I'll make that decision tomorrow. When Debbie and I lived in Houston, we would go to Joe's Crab Shack. Joe's Crab Shack outside of the restaurant had a big sign that says, Free Crabs Tomorrow. And you came in and said, Hey, I want my free crabs. They said, Oh, you got to come back tomorrow. Come in tomorrow. Oh, you got to come back tomorrow. You're never going to get free crabs at Joe's Crab Shack because the free crabs are always tomorrow. See, that's the way people live. They think, well, I'm going to do that tomorrow. That's the devil's favorite word, tomorrow. Oh, don't do that now. Just do that later. Do that tomorrow. Well, God's Word doesn't tell us to do that tomorrow. God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Isaiah 1.18, come now. Because you don't have the promise of tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You could be like that guy that Jesus told the parable about in Luke that said, uh, you know, his ship had come in and he was building bigger barns to handle all his wealth and all his grain. And he said, man, I I got it made. I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. And the Lord says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. You never counted on dying, did you? And that happens like that when we least expect it. The procrastinating person will be there. Blind Bartimaeus was a blind beggar who lived in Jericho. And every day he would go to the side of the road and he would sit there and he would beg. Well, one day he was begging at the side of the road and he heard a big big commotion. There was a big crowd of people coming through and he wanted to know what was going on. He was blind and he asked somebody, he said, hey, what's going on? What's this big crowd of people? What is happening? And they said these words to him. They said, Jesus of Nazareth. 
is passing by. I believe that Jesus of Nazareth passes by every life. Don't miss him. Jesus of Nazareth never came to Jericho again. Jesus of Nazareth, they told Bartimaeus, is passing by. And blind Bartimaeus didn't miss him. Blind Bartimaeus got up and he began to yell and he began to shout and he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they couldn't shut him up. And he received Christ that day and was saved. He didn't put it off. The procrastinating person will be there. And then the last category is perhaps the saddest category of all. This is the confused church member. This is the person who joined the church. The person who got baptized, the person who got their name on the church roll, but never got their name in the Lamb's book of life. They're confused. They think if you become a member of a church, that that's all you need to do. And they think if you're a good person, well, that's all you need to do. And they think it's all about works when the Bible clearly says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And they think they're going to make it because they're in church and they're, quote, unquote, a good person. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, many will say to me on that day, many, not a few, many, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. You were never really mine. So what if you're a Baptist? So what if you're Catholic? So what if you're Methodist? So what if you're Presbyterian? So what if you're Church of God in Christ? So what if you're whatever? The big question is not, are you this denomination or that denomination or that denomination? The big question is, have you come to know the Lord? Have you been born again? See, Jesus said in John chapter 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be born again. Have you been born again? A confused church member has never been born again. You know, a confused church member thinks, well, you know, if I sing in the choir, that uh, that ought to cut it. If I serve as a deacon or as an usher, that ought to cut it. I mean, if I teach Sunday school, if I work in the nursery, oh, man, I ought to get big points with God. That ought to cut it. If I'm on a church staff, whoo, that just catapults me over everybody. You know what the Lord says about being a deacon, about singing in the choir, about being an usher, about teaching Sunday school, if you're trusting in that to get you to heaven? You know what the Lord says about that great Hebrew word? whoop de doo <laughs> Means absolutely nothing. You must be born again, Jesus said. Have you been born again? George Whitfield was a great preacher in the 1700s, great revivalist. I mean, everywhere Whitfield went, people got saved. George Whitfield was a weird-looking guy. If you Google search George Whitfield and look up images, there's some paintings of George Whitfield. He's a cross-eyed guy. I mean, just really cross-eyed. He could look straight ahead and talk to somebody about Jesus, and this person, this person, and this person would all fall under conviction. Because he just, you didn't know who he was looking at. He's cross-eyed. And George Whitfield loved to preach. John chapter 3, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. A reporter asked him one day, said, Reverend Whitfield, why do you always preach you must be born again? And George Whitfield said, I'll tell you why. It is because you must be born again. I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne. The judge will sit on his throne. The judge will stand before him. And then aspect number three, the judgment will be measured out. The judgment will be measured out. Now, the Scripture says in verse 12, I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to to their deeds. The books, the books. What books is he talking about? The books that God has with all your deeds in it. The books 
that God keeps, the records that God keeps with his recording angel of all the things that you've ever done and that I've ever done and every person has ever done, God keeps records of that. Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. You thought you were behind closed doors on that business meeting. You thought nobody saw you committing adultery. The eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Hebrews 4.13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because the Lord will bring every act to judgment, everything that is hidden, whether it is good or evil. God just opens it up. There are books, and God produces the books as these Dead, both great and small, one by one, stand before the Lord. The books are open, and God tells them all that they have done. And God just reads off all of their sins. They're judged, everyone, according to their deeds. Oh, you say, Pastor Jeff, God knows all that about me? Yeah, he knows everything about everyone. He knows everything about you. There are books on every single person. You say, yeah, but Jeff, I'm a Christian. Does God still have books on me? Yes. And on every single page are written these words, paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. The judgment will be measured out. The books are open, and the judgment will be perfect justice. They're judged, everyone, according to their deeds. God says it twice in verse 12 and in verse 13, and every one of them according to their deeds. You know what's so ironic? People think that they get to heaven by their good deeds. They think their good deeds pave the way for, for them to get into heaven. God judges them by their deeds. Good deeds don't get them to heaven. Their good deeds pave the way to hell. Well, their deeds, they think they're so good. The Bible says there's none righteous, not even one. God says all your righteous deeds, your quote-unquote righteous deeds, are like a filthy rag in his sight. And God judges them. Perfect justice will be meted out. So much sin, so much punishment. The person who has sat in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, who has heard the gospel over and over and over and over again, and yet has not received Christ, that person will face a stiffer judgment. He knew his master's will, and he didn't do it. He'll receive many lashes. See, it is dangerous to come to church. You're here today. I want you to know this is a dangerous day to come to church. Because we're talking about the great white throne judgment, and now your ears are open, and now your eyes are open, and you know what lies ahead for everyone who rejects Christ. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, and you walk out of this room and you reject Him, and you say later, you procrastinate and say later, or you lie to yourself and say, I'm just I'm good enough as is, I'm just trusting in my good works, I'm trusting in my baptism, you do something uh, unwise and foolish like that, that will figure into the judgment because you knew your master's will. You knew what you needed to do, yet you didn't want to do it. You didn't choose to do it. It's dangerous to come to church. You say, well, I'm going to quit coming to church then. Well, too late. You're already here. I mean, you already know. It, you should have thought about that at 1025. It, it's, it's over. The judgment will be perfect justice. And the judgment will be everlasting fire. That's what Jesus said about the judgment. Verse 14, and the dead and death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The second death. See, every person at this judgment is going to hell. The Lord is determining the degree of punishment, the degree of hell. Hell's not the same for everybody. And the Lord looks at their sin record. Books were open. Obviously, not only the book of the deeds, but the Bible is going to be open. God is going to judge based on His Word. 
This is what I said, and this is how your life failed to measure up. And they're going to receive punishment. But the punishment is a lake of fire. Now, a lot of people have said, well, you know, it can't be a literal lake of fire because Jesus said it's also a place of outer darkness. You cast that slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And they said, you know, you can't have fire and outer darkness. You can with God. God knows how to do that. I don't know how to do it, but you can with God. But I want you to know, anytime the Bible talks about hell, talks about Hades, it's a place of fire. Jesus told that parable of Lazarus and the rich man. We know him, theologians call him Dives because the Latin word for rich man is Dives. So Lazarus and Dives and, and the rich man, Dives, he dies and he goes to Hades. And he says, I am in agony in this flame. Hell is a place of fire. It's a place of torment. It's a place of agony. And the Bible describes it as the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, where you're tormented day and night forever and ever. It's a terrible, horrible place. And the Scripture calls this the second death, the second death. Isn't it interesting that the Lord tells us that we must be born again? A twice-born man only dies once. But a once-born man dies twice. He faces the second death, and hell, the lake of fire, is the second death. The judgment will be everlasting fire. And you know, this is the saddest part of the whole thing. The judgment could have been avoided. See, the Scripture says in verse 12... And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now, God opens, I believe he opens the Scripture. I believe he opens the books with the deeds in them. And then he opens the book of life, and he says, is their name written in the book of life? Is it found written? And the angel says, no, Lord. His name is not found written in the book of life. Now, this is what I want you to think about. Every person that stands at the great white throne is going into the lake of fire. Every single person there, he's oh, the resurrection of the wicked. This person is someone who rejected Christ. So why does God look through the book of life to see if their name was there? He knows the name is not there. He does it for the benefit of the great and the small standing before him. He does it to show that person that, you know what? There was a spot in my book for you. I died for you. The Lord is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And the book of life is open to show that person that Jesus died for you. He shed his blood for you. He took all the hell that you now face. He already took it into himself. But you know what you said? You said no to him. You said, I don't want to go your way. As Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night he was arrested, he was praying. And he was sweating blood, and he prayed three times. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he willingly went to the cross. He chose the Father's will over his own will. He willingly went to the cross, and he gave his life, and he tasted death, and he tasted hell for everyone. Not my will, but thine be done. But now a person who rejects Christ, who says no to Christ, who procrastinates about Christ, who says, no, I'm just going to be a good person. I'm just going to be a, a, a person that, that is just a church member, and that's good enough. A person that does that, they have basically said to the Lord, not your will, but mine be done. I'm going to come my way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm like Frank, Frank Sinatra. I'm going to do this thing my way. And I'm not doing your will. I'm doing my will. And then they die. And when a person dies, if you don't know Christ, you died right now, you wouldn't go to the, straight to the lake of fire. You go to a place called Hades. Hades is like the county jail. And from Hades, 
you're resurrected one day and you stand before the Lord at the great white throne, and from the great white throne you go into the lake of fire. Hades is temporary hell. The lake of fire is permanent hell. And as you stand before the Lord, you'll hear him say, this sin, 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 this sin. He'll just read through the books. So much sin, so much punishment. And he'll look at you and say, I died for you. I gave my life for you on the cross, but you rejected me. You received not the love of the truth so as to be saved. And you said, not thy will, but mine be done. And Jesus, with tears in his eyes, will say to you, not my will, but yours be done. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. When I got saved as a 17-year-old high school senior, the motivation for me to get saved was that I didn't want to go to hell. Ever since I'd been a little kid, I knew I wanted to go to heaven. I just didn't know how to get there. And I can remember in my bed at night, I would be praying what I thought was praying, and I just said, God, I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to go to heaven when I die. When I was 17 years old, I went to a meeting and a man shared his testimony. He shared what it took to go to heaven, how you needed to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And if you will give your life to Christ and receive Christ, then he'll receive you and you'll be saved. And I went home that night and the Lord went home with me and the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, Jeff, you're the kid that wants to go to heaven so bad. If you were to die right now, you wouldn't go to heaven. You have no basis to go to heaven. You're trusting in yourself, being a good person to get you to heaven. And the Lord just showed me that I was on the highway to hell. And when I saw that, I got down on my knees and I said with all my heart, Jesus, would you save me? And he did. And he'll save you too. Listen, the Lord says, come now. Come now. Now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. I don't know who is in here and who has a relationship with God and who doesn't. But I want to tell you that you have an opportunity right now to nail down your salvation. If you have doubts about it, don't have doubts anymore. Come and confess Christ and receive Christ. And receive assurance if you're a, a one that struggles with assurance. Nail it down. And if you're here and you know you don't know him, you know you've never been born again, you know your life has never been changed. Maybe you're going on choir tour. You're going to sing about the Lord and you don't know the Lord at all. Today is the day for you. Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's the most important question of all. You see, at the great white throne judgment, every person that is there, that is cast into the lake of fire, they're there because their name was not found in the Lamb's Book of Life. They rejected God's salvation. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, having a personal relationship with Him, to ask Him to come into your heart and save you. Have you ever done that? The moment that you do that, your name is written in permanent ink in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I want to encourage you as we close out today to pray, to make sure that your name is there. Just ask the Lord from your heart, just pray this simple prayer. Just say, Jesus, I need you. And I know that I'm a sinner. And I know I can't save myself. And I believe you died for me. And you rose again from the dead for me. And Lord, right now, I ask you to come into my heart. Lord, right now, I surrender my life you. My friend, if you'll pray that prayer and mean it, the Lord will write your name in his book and you will never need to fear about the great white throne judgment. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that you just prayed that prayer, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life. Please take the time to call that number on your screen, to write me, to email me. Let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. 
You are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.